scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 2, and we're going to start with the first verse. It goes like this. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, asking, Where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod, Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it was written by the prophet. Bethlehem and the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for for you from you shall come a ruler who is shepherd to my people. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may also find him and go pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen in its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. I think the wise men are my favorite part of the Christmas story. I don't know, they just seem exotic and different somehow. Like, I don't know, it makes it really cool. <laughs> That's my favorite part of the crush, like the nativity set, when you get to put the wise men in after Christmas. Um, it, I don't know, I love them. Maybe it's the gold. And I don't know. But I was in seminary before I realized that there were not three wise men. Have you ever thought about how much of our memories of the Christmas story is shaped by things like the nativity sets we own? In fact, it's probably true that there were many, many wise people. It would have been unlikely for people to have traveled across the deserts in just a group of three people. It wouldn't have taken a large caravan of people. So we're not talking about the three kings so much as we are talking about an entire country, an entire group of people all seeing the star and deciding to follow it. And that's interesting. Because this journey required a high level of sacrifice. Now, we think about the financial sacrifice of the gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. These are expensive gifts. And each item, as Rebecca so cleverly told us, was a symbol of Jesus' life. They picked them out based on the prophecy. It was the way for them to acknowledge the birth of a king. They were in some ways, um, negotiators or, um, Lord, just left my brain. Um, you know, the people who, uh, ambassadors, there we go. <laughs> he was in there. Um, they were ambassadors from the countries that they were coming from. They were negotiating a peace with this new king, right? It was a way of submitting themselves to this baby. And in some ways, that's the bigger sacrifice. Financial sacrifice is one thing, giving of our treasure is one thing, but to sacrifice their very lives is a whole nother thing. Now, I've kind of always been interested in going to Mars, right? Like, doesn't it seem like a cool place to go? Mars, like, it has a cool name. It's red, which is also cool. But you would have to sacrifice two years on a spaceship just to get to Mars, and that seems like it's a little bit too high of a hurdle for me. I mean, the financial cost will set aside. <laughs> Someone in this fantasy will sponsor me to go to Mars because you need a pastor on Mars, clearly, in case there's an alien who needs conversion, right? I've always wanted to go to Mars, but I'm not willing to sacrifice four years of my life to do it. The wise men did. They sacrificed four years of their lives to travel to see Jesus. Maybe it's not Mars, but it's just about as cool. They sacrificed their time and their talents and their treasure 
but also effort and a willingness to never return home. They also had to sacrifice their attention. Now, I know I'm not an astronomer, that that would be also a cool job, but they spent every night looking at the sky. And I go outside every night, and I couldn't tell you what's in the sky. Could you honestly tell me if a new star appeared in the sky at night? No, it required attention, intention. It required them to look for the star. It's a determined search they have for meaning. They were paying attention. They were looking for God to appear. And that's a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice of their own priorities and a belief that whatever was on the other side of that sacrifice was worth it. The Magi knew that this journey was going to be hard. It was going to be a putting aside of the former things, of maybe their comfort, maybe their lives. But they knew that the end was worth it. Which is where we get to Herod. Now, Herod is probably the great villain of the Bible. I mean, we have Pharaoh in Moses' time, and then we have Herod. These are the two villains, and both of them are villains because of one thing. They don't look. They don't look. Not really. They're not really looking. They're not really open to the possibility that God might be speaking to them. Their ears and their eyes are not quite tuned in to the frequency of God. There's no hint in the Bible that Herod was a bad king yet. He does some bad things in a minute after the end of this story, but there's no hint that, that Herod at this point was unjust or unrighteous or any of those things, but the choice not to see the truth of the star is what makes him a villain. It's what informs all of the choices that come after that. The Bible tells us this, that after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, wise men came from the east, asking, where is the king of the Jews? And then Matthew continues with these words. When Herod heard this, he was afraid, and all Jerusalem with him. I can't help but wonder if King Herod, who gets everything else wrong, might have been a little bit right. The star was a fear-striking thing. It was a thing that changes the world. And Herod saw it and knew it and chose to turn away. Now, people knew, I think. People knew that the star was not good news for them, not in the way that they meant it. Because the world was on the edge of things. The world was on the edge of things because Rome was about to splinter. And when Rome, when the people who are in charge of ensuring that your life is, you know, safe and taken care of and not overtaken by random tribes or whatever, starts to splinter, it becomes a problem. You see, Caesar Augustus became dictator of Rome in 27 BC, and that was the end of Roman democracy. They had a bunch of emperors who followed, and each one was a little bit worse than the one before them. I mean, I think all of us know about um, Nero, who literally burns Rome to the ground, or so the story goes. And if you think it was bad for people in Rome, think about how much worse it was for people on the edges of the empire when they lost the protection that was given to them. Think about what they were experiencing in Jerusalem. They knew the world was on fire. And they saw a star, and they heard the news of a king, and it was not good news. So they didn't want to look. They didn't want to see. They didn't want to know the truth. They didn't want to see the reality of what was coming to them. So they turned away. They were afraid of the good news. So my question for you this morning is, what does the star look like to you? If you saw a star appear in the night, would it give you a good feeling? Would you approach it with a willing heart? Is the idea of a new year one that brings you joy because there's possibilities that are coming? Does it make you think of the words good news? 
Does it make you hear the words that the angel said to you, do not be afraid? Or are we more like Herod? Aware of the truth, but unwilling to approach it, to see it. Does this story call it, cause us to worry? The Reverend Maxwell Grant puts it this way. Sometimes when we speak of new, I think what you and I mostly mean is something more along the lines of improved. You know, the same, but not the same. So often it seems as if we pray only for a vague version of the here and now. And the fact is that much of the time, even faithful people can't imagine a world that's different from the one they already have. And that's the point of the story. Of course we can't see it. We can't. We're not astronomers looking at the stars. We're not the baby in the manger who see the glory of the Lord. We can't see it, and that's because we're people. But we can choose to look for it. We can live with the intention of seeing God at work in the world and receiving that as good news. Our steps towards the future, they may be small, they may be incremental, they may be two steps forward and one step back, or three steps back sometimes, but they are steps. And we can choose which direction they go. Are they steps that lead us towards the manger? Are they steps that follow that star in the night sky as good news? Or are they the ones, the steps that cause us to retreat further in? Are we locked in our palaces, afraid of a baby? This morning, the star invites us to name those fears, to name the fences which keep us from stepping towards the star, the things that keep us from following to the stable, the Magi. Do not be afraid. The angels say, do not be afraid because Jesus is the light over the horizon. It is good news whether it feels like good news every day. Do not be afraid, the Magi tell you, because I've walked this road through the journey. I know the sacrifices that it requires. I know how hard the steps are, but the star is over the stable. And that is good news. Take heart, Jesus tells us. It is I. Do not be afraid. We can make a choice, and we can live in the darkness of Herod's palace, surrounded by all the comforts in the world. Or we can walk in the light of the promise of God that shines over the horizon, which may be way scarier and way more difficult. But we shouldn't let fear be the reason we stay. Do not be afraid. For it is good news in the stable. Amen.